Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic Berto. Well, is your host. Thank you so kind of being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. What is the show going to be about? Let's get started quickly because we've got interviews and quite a bit to cover today. Blue collar jobs, food stamp lies, dispelled, sensible general in Afghanistan, and more. Uh, Ken Rusk points out that blue collar jobs are in demand. We dispel metal lies about food stamps. The general finally adds some sanity to the Afghanistan debate. And of course, I have a few things that I want to talk about with respect to Jen Psaki, uh, some of the stuff that she had to say. But anyhow, let's get busy with uh, what you guys have posted on the screen. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Jessica Taylor, I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome aboard. Chris Weatherby, how are you doing today? Michael Rutten, my brother, how are you doing? Nanette Bird Smith, welcome aboard. Rose William, how are you doing today, Rose? Uh, let's see who else we have. Early birds in the in in the chat, in the chat, in the chat. Paul Fleming, ATL checking in early. Love you, brother. You made it early. All right, let's get busy. Michael Rutten says one secret prices exposed irrational and cruel nature of U.S. Healthcare system. The database of hospital rates compiled by the New York Times and researchers at the University of Maryland, Baltimore details how patients are charged drastically different prices for the same medical care depending on what insurance company they use, with some procedures costing less if a patient has no insurance at all. We've got a broken healthcare system that bilks patients. We need real change. We need Medicare for all. Absolutely so. I want to tell you something that you learn in business school. You know, uh, a, a, a little quick, 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 quick story I, I got to tell. You know, I was in engineering. And I remember one year, I, it was very, very tough. It was hard. And I said to myself, you know what? I don't really want to go through all of this stuff, differential equation and a lot of other. Uh, I took too many tough courses in one semester. And I said, I'm going to go into business administration. And I was going to go out there. And this friend of mine, he was in business administration and came to engineering or something like that. I don't remember exactly. But he said, that would be the worst decision you make because you are not, when you look at what you believe in and what you are going to go into, you are just not going to like it. With respect to what you just said, uh, Michael, those people who are running those uh, healthcare systems that charges those different prices, they are doing, they're not bad people. That's what they learned. They didn't learn humanity. They didn't learn honesty. They didn't learn morality. They learned graphs. And graphs tell them that this is how you maximize the number of dollars that insurance company will make. This is how you maximize the number of dollars that hospital system is going to make. All right, in the hospital system, there are people coming in with various different insurances. There are people coming in with di various different, uh, either the indigent, which uh, the government's going to pay for, or some people that are not registered at all and that will provide absolutely nothing, right? So they have a formula, and this is not necessarily written down or whatever, but they know that you put all these graphs together, you can maximize the amount of money you are going to get for that hospital based on these different types of pays, irrespective of what the cost of the service really is. The only way to determine the cost of the service and what it really is, is to know what the, your total population, the sickness ratio of your entire population, you bring that in, you divide that sick population by the total cost of the service, plus what you're going to pay doctors, etc., and the price of the product that you're using, meaning the scanner and all these things, and that gives you your total cost. It's called Medicare for All, and it's the most efficient manner to deliver healthcare. Bar none. It is a mathematical certainty. But are we going to ever get that? Only if we put these programs out there and enlighten people to the theft that occurs. So thank you for bringing that information, which we, many of us should already know. But that is grand theft, grand larceny, but legal. Because that is how Business, that is what business school teaches. They teach you the optimization curve. They, they, teach, you, they teach you where the price performance curve. They, uh, then, of course, they teach you the line parts when it comes to economic things like the Laffer curve and all of that. But that's for another, that's a completely different subject. 
Second item from Rodnin. White House staff are required to get vaccinated for COVID. What? Did the White House forget how to lead by example? Yeah, they did. This needs to be addressed post-haste. Agreed. As of August, as of August. Peggy Lopez, thank you so kindly for joining the PDR Posse. And I've got to get that cream grab before it scrolls off because you guys are sure putting in a hell of a lot of comments today. And you know I have got to talk to you guys about it. And if, if you guys keep commenting on this rate, you know what it means. It actually means that we may have to can the uh, well, we don't know yet. We, we, we'll see how much time we have. But let me go ahead and, uh, and, and tell you. Anyhow, so, uh, yeah, the White House should have done that long time ago. Uh, CDC, FDA, WHO, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson were not required to be vaccinated COVID-19. However, some of these places required regular testing and various precautions for people who did not wish to be vaccinated. Also, both Moderna and Johnson & Johnson have set a deadline of early October for all to be vaccinated. Yeah, look, uh, it's a mess. It is a mess. And I, I look, uh, you know, there's so much going on at the White House. Um, there's so much going on at the White House. You have to kind of expect a few things to go, go unanswered. But the fact that I, I, it's going to be taken care of, as opposed to just saying, we ain't going to do it, I can, I can, I can deal with that. So that is, that is what we want to say here. All right, let me go ahead and, and, and say one other thing here. I'm going to put that, that thing in, uh, put Lopez's thing in a little bit. Uh, the other one, calls in Alabama over ivermectin uh, poisoning on track to nearly triple in 2021, Poison Center says. I've seen some insane alt-health memes floating around on social media telling people there's a cure for COVID. There's not, but I didn't know uh, ivermectin or neurotox uh, was a neurotoxin guess guessing neither did the hundreds of those who post them before self-medicating overdosing and getting hospitalized if you get your news from memes and actually follow through on them expect substantially more harm than good jessica taylor says here i made it look aspirin causes more uh, there are more people dying from aspirin or having adverse effects from aspirin than there are from those people who take any of the vaccines combined. Think about that. Yet people won't take the vaccine and they're willing to take horse and pig and all these other things from these other sources. It behooves me. Um, people, let's... <sighs> Sometimes uh, sometimes what happens, right, is when you're in this business, what we all do here, and we are all, you know, we are all communicating among each other and we are trying to do what's right, we have got to talk to our people out of the silly things that too many of them are doing. And we have to do it with some modicum of respect or but it makes you wonder sometimes. It does make you wonder sometimes, but we got to keep it up. Anyhow. Michael Rennan also says central banks, central banks accused of dawdling on climate as world burns. While some central bank executives claim that tackling the climate crisis is beyond their mandates, at the same time, they have positively reinforced fossil fuel financing and even directly financed fossil fuel production. We're living through the last years of humanity that can save itself from civilization collapse happening within our lifetimes. That's our reality. Yet these foresight, short-sighted banksters are blind to anything that might negatively affect their short-term economic gain. Again, I must re remind you, that's what they've learned in school. If you want to know one of the, the most vile places to be educated, go to a business school. Because what you learn is our economic system and how to maximize. Remember, what our system says is that we, our sole purpose of corporations, etc., is to maximize the profit of the shareholder at all cost. Remember that. That's all you have to remember. And what that means is climate change. Hey, climate change are going to affect those little people. We can isolate ourselves on the side of a mountain in the most stable place and live because we have all the money. But again, remember, not because you have a business degree mean that you have a lot of stairs. You don't remember that 
all of us are the ones who make things happen. And you know what? The pandemic for one short period showed that. The pandemic had the oil business on its knees. They were they were they they had they didn't have a they didn't have a solution to stop pumping oil in time. So they were paying people to take oil. Remember that. That's how smart our business system is. They were paying people to take oil because our system was not designed for reality. We'll go into that another day. Michael Redden also says, I just got home from hanging out with a friend, lunch hanging out with cats. Hey, guy, good for you. All right, uh, you're tired right now, kind of sitting in the air-conditioned stream trying to cool off. Ever hear of Skyfall drink? Nope, I haven't. Rum, blue, cura curacao, orange, and pineapple. Hey, are you turning into a rum bumper man? All right, Jessica Taylor, uh, howdy, says Nanette Bird-Smith. Uh, Chris Weatherby says AC, wipe on damp cloth and fan. I, good, good advice. Let's see, Bruce says, I had to ban my right-wing anti-vax friend who I thought would see the light. Don't ban him, brother Bruce. Don't ban him. Keep, answer him nicely because it's not, for, it's not about him. It's about those who think like him who are following the responses that you give to him. Remember, let him continue being what he is. It, that's in my humble opinion. That's my humble opinion. Please, please, keep talking to him. Because it's not about talking to him. It's about those people who see you replying to him and the, and the cordial and the, 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 the manner in where your intellect is displayed. Because that's one thing we know about you, Brother Bruce Pollard. You're one of the smartest cats out there. All right. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Bruce Pollard, I helped a local hospital do that with AI program. All right. Howdy, relatives in PDR Posse. I wish I could get your name, Mr. YouTube viewer that don't have a name. I'm grateful to see you expressing good health. Have a great visit today. We will do that. Daniel Edo says a human rights tragedy is taking place as he speaks and he's talking healthcare, huh? One has to wonder if he understands the implication of Biden's debacle in Afghanistan. There is no, let me let me qualify this, and people can take this however they want to take this, okay? The human rights debacle, or rather, what the debacle that you see in Afghanistan is no different than the debacle individual citizens of the United States in confrontation with our state of law sees. When a cop has a boot on your neck, it's no different than the Taliban having a boot on your neck. When you are living in financial distress in Appalachia where nobody is hearing your story, my brothers and sisters in Appalachia, nobody hears their story. My daughter drives through Appalachia and she says, Dad, I didn't know people in America lived like this. Every newscast is in Afghanistan. I love my Afghani brothers, my Afghan brothers and sisters. I love them. I honestly do. I want what's best for them. There's a lot of crap occurring all over the world. And the worst isn't in Afghanistan. The only thing about Afghanistan is that our plutocracy wants us to stay there so that they can continue to milk the American people to make money. There, is bad, there are bad stuff happening throughout the world. And I feel for it. But it's also happening in America to all levels of Americans. Okay? It's just not covered. You just don't see it on TV every day. They are in mass in, 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 in the briefing room. They, we have a few people talking about all the ills that are happening from Afghanistan. How many Americans have died since we've been moving people out of Afghanistan? Zero. People, let's get context. 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 As we are talking about democracy in Afghanistan... We can't even get a democracy bill passed here to prevent Republicans from saying, we don't like that election, we will cancel that election. So we are fighting for democracy in Afghanistan, we need to fight for democracy here as well. Let's get real. Understand, people understand. Lee Grant, welcome aboard. The duck that quacks, way to go, Peggy. Michael Rudnin, Laffer Curve is a joke. It is a joke. 
uh, brief, uh, Bridge MCP. Hey, PDR peeps, welcome aboard. AVQ, yep, pretty much. Uh, woo -hoo, welcome to the PDR Posse, Bridge MCP. Rose Williams is us here, here again. All right, Lee Grant says, Egberto, did you ask Ashley in a genetic alteration of a cell's in the immune system in response to an antigen? No, I did not ask her, but I mean, I sh maybe she'll be on a little later. Based on percentage, okay. Peggy Lopez, hi all. Just back from reconnecting with the sacredness of life. Glad to be home and back with all of you. Thank you so kindly for being back with us, my dear, beautiful Peggy Lopez. Movie night with Jane Fonda. Tomorrow night, we'll be watching and discussing How to Change the World, a film about modern environmental movement. T give us an update of it when you get back or when you're done seeing it. The Duck That Quack says, Climate change is good for boat and raft sales. Now going... At 50%. <laughs> All right. Michael Rennes says, used to be the corporations had temporary charters, which are dependent on them showing their actions served the public good. They changed that with many uh, laws. I mean, when uh, Alan Greens, not Alan Greenspan, uh, Milton Friedman came out and said, corporations do not have any fiduciary responsibility to people, just to the shareholders and executives. He said they owe nothing to anyone. Milton Friedman, the newest champion in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s of capitalism. He said absolutely not. In fact, he was in charge of the Chicago Boys who destroyed Argentina, Chile, and all these other countries as the Chicago Boys ran around the world. Read uh, that book by uh, Naomi Klein, The, the uh, Shock Doctrine. Please don't forget that. Carl Cox, on his worst day in the White House, Biden is a billion times better than the fascist Trump. Absolutely so, Tom. C, global warming or global broil, broil <laughs> even Michigan, is much harder this summer. At unusual 90 degrees today and no AC in the house. Air condition emits hot air, actually increases global warming. Bruce says, it's true that without dramatic action in the next couple of decades, we're unlikely to keep global warming in this century below 2.7 Fahrenheit, 1.5 Celsius, compared to pre-industrial temperatures, a threshold that experts say offers a lower risk of serious negative impacts. But the more we overshoot the threshold, the more serious and widespread the negative effects will be, which means that it is never too late to take action. All right. Uh, welcome aboard, May Wood. The Duck That Quack says, I'll bite on that about Biden versus 45. Uh, Peggy Lopez says, a corporation is a piece of paper in a file drawer in some city. The people working for the corporations do the bidding of the pieces of paper that pays their salary rather than look out for their self-interest. But also remember that corporations have something called personhood, which means they have rights like a person. And in fact, many times they have more rights than a person. Check out how much they can give to a political action committee versus an individual. I banned him to protect my family and friends. I hear you, Bruce. You do what you have to do, brother. You do what you got to do. Uh, the duck that quacks. Don't blame you, Bruce. Some folks need tough love. All right. I'm going to have to go in a minute. Let, well, let me reel real quickly. Please call now to put 888-738-3058 to put your effort and your work into passing two critical bills. Thank you for that one, E2247. The duck that quacks also says, can't sell my military hardware in Appalachia. No, you can't. Daniel Ledo, you are one who's out of touch. The supermajority of Americans want a better healthcare system. Absolutely so. Uh, let's see, just lost a lot of Oxycontin. <laughs> All right, Bruce says, uh, let's see, uh, replying, how is he out of touch? Thank you, Bruce. Rose Williams has a long one here. I'm going to read it real quick, then we'll go on to some videos. I am amazed that business schools don't have to consider the context in which each business operates, human society. I often hear folks assume that engineers and computer scientists are robotic and uncaring, but we actually have to study ethics and we are uh, supposed to adhere to the IEEE and ACM code of ethics and professional conduct. I've never heard of such a thing from it in business. And that's exact. You know, you hit it on the money. Medical, uh, medical doctors have to do the Hippocratic Oath. We as engineers have to get all these, these things correct, right? Uh, and we learn ethics. And in our electives, we also get those types of electives. And that's why we learn about humanity, etc. Business people just are, cr and I'm not talking about the individual business person. I'm talking about how they're taught. How they behave is different than how they talk. Roberto Luis, mi hermano panameño, my business partner. Politics done right. Saludos. Thank you, Roberto Luis. Bridge MCP says, Rose, I had to talk on oath for my CS degree. Exactly. Civils, I mean, a, a, a civil engineer 
and you're a computer science major, we actually interface deeply with society. Every engineer does. All right, let's see. Uh, Ledo, he compares the situation in Afghanistan with the situation in America. Let me guess. You think the totally reasonable out of touch? If, uh, no, no, you would think it's unreasonable. And you know what? There are, there are a group of people who honestly think all is well in America. 20% of the people own just about everything. But all is good in America. All is good. You know, we abstract, and, and, and I was told to use a, a word other than abstract, but I can't think of one right now. Capitalism and America, we know how to abstract pain perfectly. We learned how to let people inflict pain, turn that, that lever to shock people, to do everything. We know, we've learned how to abstract pain. And in abstracting pain, we've done quite a bit. Oh, God, you guys keep writing stuff. I will believe it, a corporation is a person when those running that corporation face prison terms for damage to people. And that's the magic abstraction again. As regards to climate change, I fear when people realize that ice age are caused by heat, causing the ice caps to melt and that glaciers to melt, causing the ocean to become less saline so that the Gulf Stream stop and the oceans to evaporate more thus causing more snowfall and ice until, you, <laughs> until the glaciers start moving down again. Uh, you must have watched that movie. Uh, I remember, I forgot the name of the movie. But anyhow, uh, Peggy Lopez says, Corporations have rights and no responsibilities. Corporations can kill as many humans they want when it is a positive gain for the bottom line. And you know what they do? When they're about to get charged, they go out of business and we are left with the mess to clean up. Lee Grant says, this Afghanistan hostage crisis could be the deathbed of the Biden administration. There's no hostage crisis in Afghanistan. All right, there could be one, but there's not one at this point in time. Actually, it's the best, it's a best uh, exit that we've had from a war we've lost. I played that for you guys yesterday. Uh, Saki says no one is stranded. Those on the ground disagree. No, no one is stranded. If they, first of all, they should have gotten out a long time ago. Norman says front end. All right, folks, first video is going to be about uh, se a sensible general on Iraq. Let's go for that. At last, at last, a general has come out and made it clear that all those talking heads and paid general know nothing of what they speaketh. Check this out and then we'll take it on the other side. It strikes me that if you consider the political constraints that President Biden has imposed on himself, his core belief that it's wrong to send service members into a potentially deadly situation that doesn't enhance core U.S. security, and then you've got the Taliban's overwhelming leverage in Afghanistan right now, the president really had no other option but to stick. At last, at last, a general has come out and made it clear that all those talking heads and paid general know nothing of what they speaketh. Check this out and then we'll take it on the other side. It strikes me that if you consider the political constraints that President Biden has imposed on himself, his core belief that it's wrong to send service members into a potentially deadly situation that doesn't enhance core U.S. security, and then you've got the Taliban's overwhelming leverage in Afghanistan right now, the president really had no other option but to stick to his initial self-imposed deadline. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. And I think one of the most interesting exercises as we've been covering this crisis over the last two weeks has been for me to go back and look at my own notes uh, in covering President and before that Vice President Biden over the years on this particular issue. And in fact, the last time I traveled overseas with Vice President Biden in 2016, it was to Iraq. And what I saw on that trip was something that was also the case on just about every foreign trip that the vice president would make was he spent as much time talking to the elected leadership of, in that case, Iraq, uh, of our own leadership on the ground there, as he did to sort of rank and file service members who were there uh, also on the ground, asking them questions about what they were seeing. And that was exactly what vice president-elect, actually, Joe Biden did in 2009 when president-elect Obama asked him to go to Afghanistan uh, on something of a fact-finding mission. And one of the things that Biden reported back to president-elect Obama about the mission there was that when he asked troops on the ground there in Afghanistan what they believed their mission was, he got different answers from just about everyone there. And that has really been at the core of what the vice president, now the president, has thought in terms of the U.S. strategy on Afghanistan. Once we got 
bin Laden, which was, of course, the initial reason we went into Afghanistan to try to dismantle al Qaeda. Biden has repeated this now as president. He sees that our national interests require us to pull out of Afghanistan to focus more broadly on a threat of terrorism that has metastasized beyond Afghanistan, but also to focus our efforts on Russia, China, these larger, more uh, powerful authoritarian regimes. And that continues to be his belief up till this moment. I want to bring in MSNBC military analyst and retired four-star General Barry McCaffrey. So, General McCaffrey, I want to get your sort of assessment of the current threat matrix here in Afghanistan. You heard President Biden say yesterday that U.S. forces and coalition troops, every day that they remain, they face a grave and growing threat. Well, look, you know, there's a legitimate debate about President Biden's decision to pull a plug on uh, forces after he assumed office. Uh, it was an elective choice. Right now, I am utterly appalled at so-called responsible people arguing with Biden's decision to leave by 31 August, in accordance with apparently failed negotiations with the Taliban to extend it. One brigade on the ground, one runway, surrounded by mountains, your air power is 1,200 miles away, and you're 7,000 miles from home. We do not want a shooting confrontation and withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're not going to get all the Americans out. We're not going to get all the sensitive Afghan uh, people that cooperated with us out. Uh, we're going to have to take other diplomatic means. But anyway, the bottom line is I'm looking at, you know, Congressman McCall and others thinking, what are you doing? Do you want a one brigade fight on a runway uh, in Kabul airport? This is nuts. Yes, that is nuts. Let's be clear here, folks. Uh, President Biden has never changed his stance on Afghanistan. When he worked under President Obama, he was the vice president, and he did what President Obama wanted to do. He told us straight up, and we all agreed, the progressives inclusive, we want out of Afghanistan, and that's exactly what he did. Now, Donald Trump sort of set it up the wrong way. Uh, he modified it some, but we wanted out of Afghanistan. The people that are complaining understand what's going on right now. This is the mission of the military industrial complex trying to create some dissension so that no attempt is further made for us to get out of foreign outposts because this is going to be a hit on the money tree that goes to these parasites who use our service people as props to enrich a few. Don't ever forget that that is what's really happening here. You know, uh, interestingly, today at the uh, press briefing with uh, Jen Psaki and, of course, the, the, the Fox News, uh, the Fox News, very intellectual person, I want, I want to tell you something. Because uh, I think Jen Psaki, Jen Psaki looked very, very tired today as she gave the press briefing. So she wasn't as snappy as she should have been. She just showed that she wasn't going to take a lot of stuff, but she was tired. I do see wanted to find out, hey, um, are you guys negotiating with terrorists, meaning the, the, uh, the, the Taliban? I want you to listen to this, and then I have something to say at the other end. So I want you to listen to this, and then we'll take it completely on the other side. The next one, just as these negotiations about safe passage for Americans and mm -hmm. SIV holders continue, why haven't we heard the president say, the United States does not negotiate with terrorists. Is that still the U.S. policy? Well, of course it is, Peter, but I would also say that uh, there's a reality that the Taliban is currently controlling large swaths of Afghanistan. Uh, that is a reality on the ground. And right now our focus and our priority is getting American citizens evacuated and our Afghan partners evacuated. And I would say, given the numbers that we've outlined and briefed for you, uh, that we've had made a great deal of progress in doing exactly that. Now, let me tell you what drove me crazy about her answer. She's absolutely right. But she didn't say that. Please remember that the person that started this mess that we're in right now started this mess after negotiating with the Taliban and getting the leader of the Taliban out of the Pakistani jail that 
our CIA got Pakistan to put him in. You took him out as well as you took out 5,000 or so fighters out of jail. You negotiated with Pakistan. You negotiated with the Taliban. You also told them that you are going to keep the real government, that we, the United States, were... It's a corrupt government, too. The corrupt government in Afghanistan, you kept them out of the discussion altogether. Who, again, negotiated with... Far, with, with who, who negotiated with terrorists again? Um, I think it was Brother Trump. Don't forget it. But anyhow, there was one other piece with Jen Psaki that I want to take a look at. Um, and, and this one, she got good, right? She, she did, I think, perfectly. J Jen Psaki was asked, hey, just like uh, Ledo just asked, why are you talking about health care now? There's a crisis in Afghanistan. And her answer was exactly what it needed to be. Let's listen to it, and then we'll take it on the other side. He gave a lot of time to the domestic agenda. Does he think that the Build Back Better plan is as urgent and as time sensitive as this evacuation of Americans and Afghan friendlies from Kabul? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's important to the American people who care deeply about whether they're going to have jobs, whether they're uh, going to have child care, uh, whether they are going, whether we are going to be able to compete uh, with China and countries around the world, to understand that we have to do multiple things at the same time. That's exactly what any president of the United States has to do. Exactly. That is exactly any president of the. That's exactly what any president of the United States has to do. Okay, uh, one last, well, you know what? Uh, what time is it here? 45. I am going to have to drop one of my videos, and I think the video that I will drop is going to be 20 plus 35, 55. Ah. Let me do the food stamps video. Before I do the food stamps video, I I'm going to drop the interview that I had for today because we're running out of time. I didn't realize that I was going to spend as much time with uh, the questions or the statements that you guys make, but you all come first, so we do that first. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, para ver. I'm going back up the list here. Michael Rudnick says, terrorists are non-state actors. Taliban are now the de facto government. They are no longer terrorists. I've actually, a very good fact, but at the time that uh, Trump negotiated, they were terrorists. Bridge MCP says, uh, wait, isn't that Trump did negotiate with the Taliban and leave out the Afghan president? Muchisimas gracias, Bridge MCP. That's what I tell you about having smart people that are listening. All right, the duck that quacks. Our guys are stuck with the cleanup after his guy and bankruptcy expert negotiated another poor deal. I mean, but that, is, that has been a constant. We've always had to have democratic government, and, and, and look, I'm not a super, like, think the Democrats are the best thing since apple pie, but they always have to come in and clean up after Republicans screw things up. Both economic downturns on the Republicans, uh, wars on the Republicans, I mean, it, it's always the same crap all of the times. Don't know how to govern. Carl Foster says, uh, border, magic money tree, jobs to China, Afghanistan, etc., etc., Carl, I mean, uh, any time you want to, because uh, you are one of our other conservatives that are frequent here, so you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. I want you to keep listening and watching. But any day that you are interested in calling in, and I'll give you a full 10-minute segment that we can go back and forth with those issues that you're talking about. Magic money tree, border security, jobs to China, and Afghanistan. I'll give 2.5 minutes to each one of those issues. You make your statement, and I answer it. You make your statement, and I answer it. That's all. Very, very good discussion we can have there. Jessica Taylor, everyone wants to forget that Trump started and wrote this script. Thank you. The duck that quacks the border, Afghan, are being flown in. Uh, the duck that quacks says 90% of everything Trumpolini sells is made in China. Absolutely, if not more. Carl Foster, TDS Vax unavailable. Egberto, huh? Don't understand. Let's see what uh, Rose has a Facebook thing on there. I'll take a look at it after Rose. Uh, Michael Ryan says, Do conservatives believe we as a nation can only focus on one issue at a time? Exactly. Uh, Bridge MCP says, you were, you, You're here chatting, sharing, learning. All is in free. Oh, I forgot again. It's after half an hour. Folks, please, if you are on YouTube, 
please support this channel. Thank you very much for reminding me, Bridge MCP. Please join the PDR Posse by going and click that join button that you see right there on the screen. Click the join button, become part of the PDR Posse. You see how today Peggy Lopez became a part of the PDR Posse? And she actually got the, she got the membership that gets her every single one of the books that I have written and every future book that I write. And right now I'm, I'm right, I'm, I've already started writing my fifth book. The first book, as I see it, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right Wing Doom. My second book, Lose Weight and Be Fit, because I was having problems. So I, I write it and then lived it. Then, of course, it's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors, and how to make America Utopia, my last book. You get to read all of those online if you, get the, if you subscribe to that particular membership. And I'm writing another book right now. I hope to have it done in a couple months. Uh, and uh, I have like four books that I've already kind of itemized, uh, itemized out already. So check it out. Go, to, uh, go click on, on Join. And, and, and select one of the options, if you will. I'd be forever indebted to you. And the movement would forever be indebted to you. Alternatively, you can go to politicsdoneright.com slash support. politicsdoneright.com slash support. And by going to politicsdoneright.com slash support, uh, you can actually go ahead and um, choose whatever method you want to uh, support us. Carl Cox, we received your postal money order. Uh, please send me an email to remind, because since you're doing it out of channel, please send me an email to remind me to subscribe you to read our books online. So please uh, please uh, go ahead and remind me to do that, Carl Cox. Um, okay, also you can buy our books directly online, hard copy or Kindle by going to politicsandright.com slash books. You can get our books in our store along with T-shirts and all that kind of stuff if you want to cut out the middleman for the books, and I'll send it to you with things like my uh, Politics and Right sticker for your car, etc. cetera. Uh, you can go to politicsandright.com slash store, politicsandright.com slash store. And uh, let's see, of course you can support me with PayPal, anything. If you go to politicsandright.com slash support, it has all that good stuff in there on how to support us. It is worthwhile because this is, this is our life. This is what we're going to be doing. This is what we're going to be doing. Okay, let me get back to the word. And thank you for reminding me to do it as usual. You know, that is why uh, British MCP is the leader of our PDR C. All right, Jessica Taylor says... That part, exactly. When Trump validated them by inviting them to negotiations. Exactly. Exactly. Norman says abstraction and innocuous avatar. That is, a, that is one of the terms that you said, innocuous avatar. But Roberto Lewis had another, uh, some other words that, that he put in there that I wanted to use as well. Roberto, where are your words? I saw it as I was. Roberto says, let's talk about apprehension, preconceptions as well. Exactly. All right, let's see. Um, continuing, uh, let me get down here. Magic money tree? Is that how Donnie only pays $750 in income taxes each year? No, he pays that because he's not a real billionaire. Uh, Carl Foster says, walk away, Joe. I don't think he is. Actually, look, I am, I am a very progressive person, but I'm telling you what. Joe's $3.5 trillion deal that he's working on with Bernie and others, um, I tell you what, I'm not, I'm not unhappy. That's all I'm going to say. And for some of the stuff that it has with climate change as a good start, I'm not unhappy. All right, Egberto, is there a particular time crunch for your show? Do you want to make the show 10 minutes longer? I don't, let me tell you why I don't do the 10 minutes longer, because there are a lot of people who uh, want one hour. That's what they speak. Specify one hour. What I may start doing in the long run is have an extended edition and then uh, put the extended edition only for members only or something like that. You guys can give me ideas. What, what I want to do, I want to tell you something. For those of you that are, that are actually subscribers, right? Look, if it's up to me, I just throw things out there for everybody to see. But I want to be able to, I, I want you guys to give me some advice of what can I do, what other special things can I do for those people who are uh, financially invested in, uh, in politics and right, or those also who are sharers of, you know, I mean, you can do all kinds of things to help us get the message out. Give me some ideas. It's your show. Drop me a line. Don't put it online. Send it to info at politicsdoneright.com and say, Egberto, you need to do this. Egberto, you need to do that. We remember how we work here. 
Jessica Taylor says, why I do why do I love the way Egberto says Taliban? <laughs> You're making fun of me, uh, Jessica Taylor, but you know I love you. All right. Can I can you ride a bike? Yeah, you can ride a bike real fast. Norman Reynolds says, the Afghanistan Taliban may never be recognized by the US government. They better, I mean, I they better recognize an official government, okay? Because we have a lot of their money that they have to get, okay? Uh, Jessica, I love the way he says many words. All right, you guys are gonna let me blush. If I if I weren't, if I if I didn't have this hue, you would see me blushing. But I have a hue, guys. Carl Foster, where are you going? You stay you stick around, my brother. I'm off to troll CNN. <laughs> okay, go troll somebody else. All right. Debbie Waleski, Peter Ducey and Fox News don't care about rescuing any Afghan people because they are all racist, just as the Trump administration was. Carl Cox says, I joined by postal money order. I took care of that. Or rather, send me an email. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. Pecky Lopez, Republicans move all the right and the Democrats' job to hold the country at the new right until normal. And then Republicans again move to the right, giving new and more power to the corporations. Ah, yes. Whenever you hear someone mispronounce a word, know that most likely they learned how to say it by reading. You know, I, the joke that I have in my book, when I came to the States, there was a, a chain called You Totem. And, you know, and in Panama, you is ooh. So when I came to the States, I would call it Utotem. So when, when, when people say, hey, where, where, where did you get that, that drink or where did you get that um, that bar, I would say, oh, I got it at the Utotem. <laughs> They'll be like, what? You told them. So I said the American way. When I came to the States also, I said Brenham, Texas. That's the first city that I was going to. Brenham, Texas. The lady at the bus stop said, what? I said, ma'am, here's a book for the school, Brenham, Texas. That's not Brenham, Texas. That's Brenham, Texas. I'm like, ma'am, can I get a ticket to Brenham, Texas? Okay. All right, anyhow, long concealed records show Trump's chronic losses and years of tax avoidance. Tell me about it. A business, as a businessman, Trump was the biggest loser of all, says Michael Rudnan, and he has the New Yorker to prove it. Makes me, Michael Rudnan says, makes me wish the rest of the nation listened to my fellow New Yorkers. We knew Trump was a con man. I don't know that it matters because Trump gave them something that they needed. Kathy Pascal loved the way he says, rolls the R's. You know, I roll the R's like, I know, I don't have to roll the R's, but I kind of do it sort of because it, it's fun, you know? And when I'm talking about these, it, it, it is really, really fun. Look, I, I've been here for several decades. I can... I can speak American if I need to, but, you know, I, I kind of like to have a little bit of flair to the stuff as well. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, of course, there are a lot of accents I put on words that is sort of like automatic now. Like when I say Taliban and all that kind of stuff, that's what comes to my head first. Then I remember Americans would say Taliban or, you know, so there are a lot of things that come to the head first. Anyway, I want to uh, give you the piece about food stamps. Because I found this enlightening, and I think a lot of people should find this enlightening. Let's go for it. You know, the Republican Party has trained its followers, good people, but good Republicans. They have given them the impression that people the other, people that don't look like their generic base, are always on the dole or asking for a handout, as opposed to a system that creates that problem. But they have their people fooled because they don't quite acknowledge the genesis of the problem. As an example, the food stamp program, the SNAP program, President Biden has actually increased by a little bit, about 40 cents or so per meal, the amount of money people get from the food stamp. And of course, the right wing goes berserk, another giveaway. It, we are we are, we are giving away to those people, those freeloaders, but the reality is all different. Who really gets food stamps? Whose base gets most of the food stamps? As we say, we like to dispel the lies that these people are known for. Check this out. The Biden administration announced the largest permanent increase to food stamps. Ever. Average monthly benefits will rise by $36 or about 40 cents per meal. Now, not surprisingly, the right wing is freaking out already, but it's important to remember just who SNAP primarily benefits. 
the GOP base. Contrary to the generation's old Republican myth popularized by Ronald Reagan and the trope of the black welfare queen, white folks actually make up the largest group of those receiving SNAP. Joining me now is Clara Dehart, a current SNAP recipient, and Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America and author of America We Need to Talk. You know, I think there's a lot of misconception about who gets SNAP benefits, um, who gets food stamps, and you know, there's this idea that people are living high on the hog. But really, food stamps, you can't get a lot of things on food stamps. You can't get things like detergent and essential household items and sanitary products and deodorant and toothpaste, things like that. So this is not people living high on the hog, having lobster and steak every night. No, Tiffany. And, you know, we're obviously having a great national debate about what makes America stronger at home and in the world. And there's no question that that starts with feeding our own people. No superpower in the history of the world has remained the superpower if it's failed to feed its own people. The vast majority of recipients of SNAP are working adults, children, senior citizens, people with disabilities, and veterans. The average length of time before the recession people got SNAP was about eight months. Most people get it briefly when they're down on their luck. Half of all Americans, half of all Americans will get SNAP at some point during their lives. And this helps create jobs at supermarkets and farmers markets and help farmers. It's the opposite of a welfare program. It's an American strength program. Absolutely. I mean, look, growing up, I lived in a household where we lived on benefits for a while. Even to this day, there are members of my immediate family who receive SNAP benefits. So we have to lift the shame uh, and, and start talking about it, which brings me to you, Claire. I'm so happy to have you here to tell your story. You're a recent college graduate and you received the benefits. Tell me um, how these benefits have helped you and why you need them. You know, I had never even considered using SNAP benefits most of my life. Like growing up, I never struggled with food insecurity or anything like that. But just last November, 2020, I decided to take a position serving as an AmeriCorps VISTA. And, you know, it's been a great opportunity working at the Mid-Ohio Food Collective in Columbus, but you know, trying to make do on the living stipend that I receive while also paying for, you know, nutritious food has been a struggle. So I actually signed up for SNAP back in April of this year. And it's really just made a big difference in you know, the amount of food I can afford, the diversity of food I can afford. So I'm not just buying like, you know, instant ramen and peanut butter, you know, I'm right. buying like just, it's really expanded my access to food and been like really important for me in this short period of time as I'm serving through AmeriCorps. And you deserve to have nutrition in your life, uh, as do um, everyone, really. It should not be um, a luxury. Joel, the new calculations mean, um, basically, this is an increase of like $36 per person per month. This is going to begin October 1st. And really, the amount will vary uh, by state. Um, what impact will this have? Because you just completed this tour where you've been all across the country seeing people who are hungry and in need of this. What impact will this increase have, even though it's not a lot? How will it impact people who, who need this? As you noted, Tiffany, I just drove myself to 37 states from coast to coast, 15,000 miles around the country, visiting hunger sites, visiting with nonprofit groups, talking to low-income people. And the bottom line is this SNAP boost is a life preserver for hungry Americans. It's the federal nutrition safety net that's been the thing that stood between tens of millions of Americans and Ethiopia style or North Korea style starvation. So it's not a lot of money, but before the pandemic, the average SNAP uh, benefit was a dollar thirty per meal. Who can live on a dollar thirty per meal? So it's a bit much for me that people who are going on and on how how horrible it is giving people a few cents a meal boost are the very same people who have no problem giving corporate agribusiness uh, welfare payments to multi million dollar corporate agribusinesses. This is a small life preserver to very hard working struggling Americans. Yeah, and just as a reminder to our viewers, during the Trump administration, the USDA fought hard uh, against. Uh, these increases. They wanted to limit access to the benefits. Um, House Republicans fought bitterly to impose uh, more work requirements um, from the, the last farm bill. And this impacts their base. So it's, you know, kind of bizarre. Yes, this impacts mostly their base. But here's the funny thing about it, okay? 
the uh, food stamps go to a lot of working people, hardworking people, the Walmart employee because they don't pay a, a living wage. The, the employees of many other companies, McDonald's and all these guys, we are subsidizing the shareholders of McDonald's, the executives of McDonald's because they don't pay a fair wage and in order to sustain people, in order to do the humane thing, we have to pay the American citizenry themselves have to pay to help our fellow citizens stay uh, uh, stay healthy with a, a, a modicum of good, good good food. So, folks, don't be fooled by or, or or stop allowing the right wing to make you believe that those others are taking more than their fair share. When the reality in this country is that the welfare, the biggest welfare recipients in this country are the rich. The people who do the least in this country, the parasites, are those super ultra rich. I'm not talking about somebody who's worked hard to be self-sufficient and be an independent person with a few million dollars in the bank. I'm not talking about those people. But the super rich, those that are dependent solely on stock, those that are dependent, those who always go around saying, my money is working for me. Remember, that's not true. Money can work for no one. Anytime you hear things like that, anytime you watch the ultra-rich, remember they are parasites to the system. They are the biggest welfare recipients in this country. And the hard-working people like we just saw on that screen, the hard-working people at Walmart, the hard-working people at McDonald's, the person that's sweeping your floor, and all those that are dependent on, on, on uh, minimum wage and otherwise, they are the heroes of our society. And if sometimes you think they're miserable or unkind if a system has you such under stress wouldn't you be too yes i would be too yes i would be too um i want to touch on something that uh paul fleming said because that really i want to kind of expand on that paul says when you say some republicans are good people i have to question that when they agree to hate the greatest sin is to do things in an unconscious state, not thinking before you act, not trying to love before you hate. The only reason why this country is great is because of all of our contributions. That sentence is absolutely true. The only reason this country is great, you're absolutely right. Now, when it comes to, um, when it comes to the, the, the question that you said, I have to question that when, I have to question that when they agree to hate. It's not that they're ever agree, they never agree to hate. And this is, this is what I've had to teach myself in order not to have reverse hate against those who we see hate in, right? They were very, th th there's a fear within some people, and it's not only the fear, but it's a psychological manner in which it is effected in them. So what we think of as them hating other people is them fearing other people and Activation of their survival skills. The animal survival skill because they think. It's irrational. It is irrational. And the plutocracy depends on that sector in our brains that makes us behave that way that we would invade on January 6th. That we will lynch somebody. That we will look at, that we would, you know, that, that experiment that they show that I have a thousand cookies and you have one cookie and the other guy has no cookie and you the person with a thousand cookies tell the person with one cookie be careful that guy with no cookie is trying to take yours it's a psychological game and that is what we we as the we as the people who understand the game and can go beyond the chemical reactions that's been inflicted in our brains we can go beyond that that's what it's going to take for us to get through those other folk, to teach them how to get beyond that chemical reaction of fear that the other side knows how to impart on these people. We can't all just be in that circle because then nothing ever changes and the only people that win are the people who have mastered how to control us all. It's, it's just that that's the way it is. Rose Williams, irrational, over, overactive amygdala. Exactly. Poor emotional intelligence. Uh, let's see what is replying to Paul Fleming. Curious, have you watched HBO's The Newsroom describing the Tea Party? 
Uh, yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing. Anyway, folks, we're getting to the end of the program. I want you guys to follow what Peggy Lopez did. Please click that join button, become a part of our PDR Posse. Also, please remember to go ahead and support us in any fashion that you can by going to politicsdoneright.com slash support. politicsdoneright.com slash support. Get our books, and our books are, I mean, the books, I you know, worth it. Go to politicsunright.com. Whoops, missed that. politicsunright.com slash books. politicsunright.com slash books. Shop at our store, politicsunright.com slash store. politicsunright.com slash store. Look, I know you could be anywhere, but you're here with me. I want to thank all of you. If I forgot to call you out, Alicia, I don't think I called you out today. Welcome aboard, Alicia. Tom C., I don't know if I called you out. If I did, you know, what can I say? The, you know, the brain, how it works. All right, and I think I called out E2247. I think I called out everybody else. I'm kind of scrolling up to see if I see a name that I may not have called out. If I haven't called you out, just drop a line in there. Carl Cox, I think I called you out, did I? I'm not sure. Uh, Jessica Taylor, Maywood, if you have another one, just drop me a line and I'll call you out. All right, folks. Look, folks, I know you could be anywhere, but you're here with me. I appreciate that. I'm honored. Thank you so kindly for being here. Love you all. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you know how I end this program. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.